Chapter 1. Spirituality is in the fore in the quest for creativity. Unimpaired creativity plays around the importance of acknowledging the essence of what Julia Cameron calls the Great Creator. For some, this could be God, while others could settle for a less volatile analogy like a higher power. Whatever you choose to use, or whether you refuse to believe in the unconventional or simple notion, does not matter. More importantly, artists, regardless of the type of art, are constantly trying to tap into their creative being, and their ability to effortlessly do this defines their success. Julia Cameron takes us through her personal self-discovery journey that showed her that she did not have to drink or use some booster substances to be creative. Creativity is our second nature. Taking alcohol or indulging in other vices to spark our creative senses counter our nature. Moving forward, Julia Cameron admits that her sobriety and creativity battles had helped her see through the hectic processes it took for her to engage her artistic self. Through her transition from a creative block-prone artist to a progressively artistic individual, Cameron was able to identify her spiritual pilgrimage towards mind rebuilding as the telling factor. Contrary to the belief that the former curtails the latter, spirituality is an essential part of every artistic journey. It is vital that you see yourself as a contributing component of the vast sea of art that defines the universe. Only then would you understand that external factors do not determine your connectivity. Rather, it is your inward belief in the process and your rhythmic adherence to the flow that deliver creativity. Hence, everyone has an artist within, and it takes a spiritual unraveling to set them free. We are burdened with tapping into the mystique of communication between our creative instinct and the great creator before we can truly become artists. This summary is not only about the techniques you can apply to channel your creativity. Aside from the necessity of writing or creating something every day, learning new things and excavating the gem ideas scattered around you in the universe, you will realize that this text is self-therapeutic. Even if you are not going to be an artist, you can still find this summary quite resourceful for learning to accept yourself as you are, raise your self-esteem, and make do with depleting effects of workaholism. Chapter 2. Write daily and try new things to get your creative juices flowing. In case you're hoping to revive your imagination, you don't need to begin by writing your masterpiece. Instead, begin with some less difficult first steps, such as daily journaling. Daily writing helps you to get your imagination flowing, especially if done when you first wake up. Simply take a seat, let your imagination go wild, and write whatever you feel like. Consider your writings as a type of reflection. Shut out the outside world and focus on what you're doing well right then and there. If you don't have the foggiest idea on what to write, write that you don't know what to write. You can boost your creativity by constantly seeking inspiration by going to a theater, museum, or trying out new activities even though they're not related to art. When chipping away at your morning pages, aim to stifle the basic, sensible part of your brain. Give your artist brain a chance to take over. Try not to stress over committing errors or the pressure to write something splendid. The artist brain wants to play and try things. Let it go. You should also take your creative side on a date from time to time. Spend a few hours per week on your inner artist. Go dancing. Watch a play. Go to a museum or simply take a walk. The point is to unwind without anyone else and enable your mind to drift. Writing is like breathing. It's possible to learn to do it well, but the point is to do it no matter what. Julia Cameron You'll see that the more you explore yourself and your general surroundings, the more you connect with your artistic side. That is the reason it is so critical to learn as much as you can about yourself and your environment. Continuously seek out new tastes, scents, sights, or sounds. Chapter 3. Reconnect with your true self by embracing your flaws and imperfections. 
after taking time out of your busy life as an artist to admire the little things and engage with your morning pages, you will start to understand the importance of listening. Creativity flows through us, but only those who have mastered the art of listening can become a vessel of undiluted artistry. Kill the urge to force the process. Rather, you should trust in it and let your body convey its end product. It is essential to understand that art is organic. Therefore, it is the exact opposite of the creative exercise that centers on repetitive and burdensome processes. As an artist, you should try as much as possible to evade the pitfalls of perfectionism. For work to turn out good, it will first come out bad. In other words, embrace flaws and stop being afraid of making mistakes. It is only then you will become comfortable to take risks and chart the unknown. In reality, your artistry brilliance depends on your capacity to take risks. Go beyond the tag that has been used to define your art. However, very few have broadened their horizons by changing their perspective on the benefits of breaking the norms. In the place of fearlessness, they have clouded their feelings with raging jealousy. The act of masking your fear with jealousy turns you into a critic of other artworks. You feel like others are getting it easier or you could have done a better job if you had had the chance. Creatively blocked artists are typically jealous people. Did you know? Being an artist sometimes comes with experiencing shame when you share your innermost secrets and emotional turmoils, but that is the price of sincerity. Chapter 4. Beat Self-Doubt and Inner Demons to Build Your Confidence We battle with extreme, unavoidable situations in our lives. Creative individuals frequently need to confront and conquer tough conditions. For instance, Many parents refuse to allow their children to work as an artist because they feel it is not lucrative enough and the money will never be great. These individuals often end up becoming shadow artists. They settle for unfulfilling jobs and even if they manage to become successful in that field, shadow artists will be haunted by the creative life they never had. Julia Cameron had a conversation with Edwin, a shadow artist who is a millionaire. Edwin's dad made him go into finance. Presently, he surrounds himself with art and artists to make up for the art career he couldn't have. Shadow artists regularly end up in fields related to the art they cherish. A shadow poet may work as a copywriter, for example. If you have been pushed far from art, you have to discard the stigma related to being an artist and focus on the positive perspectives. In the event that you are told artists are insane, you need to deliberately let yourself know artists are sane. You likewise need to find what keeps you down. At times, thoughts hold creative people hostage. Thoughts like doubt can be nerve-wracking. Imagine a singer, for instance, who has so much self-doubt that they never send their demo to any music producer. But thoughts are only one issue. People can bring you down as well. You could fall prey to a crazy maker, an individual who benefits from your attention while also belittling you. Crazy makers are often successful artists themselves. They will, in general, surround themselves with gifted artists with lower self-confidence than theirs. Try not to let a crazy maker scare you. Keep in mind, the main person in charge of your creativity is you. Did you know... One way to switch off your logical brain into a creative one is to engage in activities that don't require your analytical thinking, such as doing the dishes, working in the garden, steering a wheel, etc. Chapter 5. A recovery process is the only way to reconnect with your creative self, but it can be emotionally challenging. If you haven't been creative for a while, it's not always simple to recover your artist side. However, don't stress. When you start diving into your creative internal world, you'll begin to discover weird musings and feelings. These discoveries can be frightening, but at the same time, they're crucial. Anger, for instance, is absolutely unpleasant, but not really something to flee from. Anger can inspire you to move the right way. For instance, you may hear a song and feel angry because you think you could have sung it better than the musician at the show. 
If you feel like that, pay attention to your feelings. Write your thoughts down and work toward that goal. Art can likewise lead you into some sensitive subjects, both for you and your audience. People may lash out at you if your work hauls them out of their comfort zone, as an erotic painting might. If people attempt to make you feel embarrassed about your art, don't allow that to get you down. You need to continue having faith in yourself. One approach to do that is to have positive reviews from old projects handy. Try not to give the negativity a chance to drag you down. Recognize and accept every emotion you experience, even if it is negative, for emotions teach us a lot about ourselves. You'll additionally find new weaknesses and strengths as you study yourself. Even after thousands of shows, a musician might still have stage fright before every performance. In case you're feeling blocked, think about approaching somebody for a prompt. You might possibly feel much better when somebody tells you what to write, like if your editor asks you to write a story about a soccer match. There's nothing wrong with requesting a prompt. Anger, negativity, blocks. You're progressing nicely if you've discovered these sorts of shortcomings. They mean your recovery process is in progress. Remain patient and continue writing your morning pages. They'll keep you tied down to your goal of reconnecting with the creative virtuoso within you. Chapter 6. You don't produce ideas out of the blue. You find them around you and help them develop. When Michelangelo produced his popular David statue, he said he discovered David. He didn't create him. In the same way as other incredible artists, he thought of himself as a mere vessel conveying something a lot bigger than himself. He was correct. Artists don't generate new ideas. They discover them. When you acknowledge this, you'll never again experience the ill effects of creative blocks. The pressure to think of a splendid idea can feel overpowering. The thing is, you don't create an idea any more than you would make a tree. Like a tree, an idea begins as a little seed, and you're only in charge of overseeing its development. The seeds of all arts, songs, books, movies, and other creative works are out there in the world. When you discover one, take care of it. Keep an eye on it so it can develop. That is all an artist truly needs to do. We limit our creativity by wrapping God into the anthropomorphic father figure rather than perceiving him as an infinite source of inspiration. If you continue attempting to take care of these ideas, you may even find there's a higher power out there who is helping you. When you're energetic about your artistic vision, you will begin to see new doors open. You may meet your idol at a function or get offered another acting gig. God will support you if you try, but you are still the one in charge of your creative life. If you are not content with your present circumstance, you are the person who needs to roll out the improvement. Julia Cameron knew a writer named Kara, for example, who had an abusive agent, but she was hesitant to leave him because he was so prestigious. She eventually fired him after an awful telephone call with him. Her husband got a call from another agent that same day. Kara called the new agent, and they have been working together from that point onward. Chapter 7. Excessive Competitiveness, Workaholism, and Perfectionism Will Only Block Your Creative Flow. The worst enemy of an artist is fear. It can keep you from seeking out your dreams, obstruct your creativity, and make you question yourself even when things are going great. Most times, fear of failure is rooted in your childhood experiences. One unsupportive teacher or parent who said you would never make it could impart a deep-rooted fear of failure. Jealousy is always a mask for fear, fear that we aren't able to get what we want, frustration that somebody else seems to be getting what is rightfully ours even if we are too frightened to reach for it. Julia Cameron You can cause fear yourself. How? By asking a lot from yourself. Unrealistic goals like aiming to produce a movie in December when it's already October, are hazardous. You won't meet these goals, and after that, you will accuse yourself. You will begin to feel jealousy, grief, regret, and self-loathing, making it difficult to have any creative flow. 
Then you will start putting yourself down for not achieving anything, undermining your very own self-confidence to the point where you're anxious about attempting another project, and you'll surrender. Other than the dread you can bring upon yourself, there are two risky and useless habits you need to pay attention to. The first is workaholism. A few people react to creative feelings by being a workaholic. And if you consider creativity as God's vitality flowing through you, it might make sense that a few people react with such a compelling, compassionate reaction and work excessively. Yet, workaholism is counterproductive. Working too much makes it difficult to explore God's energy coursing through you. It's smarter to let your mind smoothly investigate thoughts normally and not force them. Competitiveness is also ineffective for creativity. It misleads you by making you focus on the wrong questions, like, for what reason did he get signed by a label and not me? Avoid this trap by asking yourself positive questions such as, did I write today? The golden rule is to compare yourself to how you used to be in the past and never to other people. Chapter 8. Make a conscious effort to expose your creative side. Each artist needs a dash of self-confidence, so if you want to restore your creative self, you'll need to reevaluate your past to perceive what may have harmed your self-confidence and how you can resuscitate it. Start by thinking back and choosing three past encounters that brought down your feeling of self. Any experience or memory counts, even those that may appear to be silly. If a teacher laughed at your sketches in high school, put it on the list. Recognizing the moments that hurt your self-confidence will enable you to confront them and overcome them. This is the main way you can heal from the hurt they caused. You can also improve your confidence with imaginative exercises such as picturing your ideal creative day. What would you do after getting out of bed? What would you have achieved at the end of that day? Picture yourself overcoming difficulties as well. Remind yourself you can. Affirmations are another great method to support your artistic self. Consistently pick five affirming sentences per week and try to remind yourself of them regularly. For instance, I'm creative. My imagination is a fortune. I have a great deal to offer, etc. Look into your childhood and adolescence to recall every situation when your self-esteem was undermined by other people. Write these situations down and reflect upon the impact they had on your life. Create helpful habits as well. If you end up disappointed when you don't achieve enough in one day, try to build the habit of pausing and taking a deep breath. Then think of what you could achieve in the rest of the day. You ought to build up the habit of surrounding yourself with a greater amount of life's little delights. Fill your home with nice scents or wear your most loved outfit for no specific reason. Compose positive reminders for yourself such as, Treating myself to a valuable object will make me strong. Your creative juice will be flowing through you in the blink of an eye. Conclusion It is difficult to activate your creative potential. However, everybody can do it. If it appears to be overwhelming, simply begin with a couple of straightforward steps. Write morning pages, investigate new topics, and take yourself out often. When you start glimpsing inside and concentrating on your artistic objectives, you'll locate your creative self in no time. Put this way, it appears to play down the importance of self-work each of us needs to do in pursuit of genuine creativity. For example, your morning pages are a perfect locus to be spiritually naked with the writing mirroring your inside world. However, it takes enormous bravery to face yourself as you are because no one is perfect. We all feel rage, jealousy, and fear at times. We need to embrace them to be whole, heal, and unblock our creative potential. One common mistake everyone makes is thinking that we are the source of creativity. However, the original is always some higher power that we tend to refer to as God or the Absolute. Thus, engaging in the acts of creativity, we only channel what already exists in the most perfect form and is much bigger than ourselves. Another point we tend to get wrong is that we can force creativity either by incessant overworking or ceaseless perfectionism. 
The first one always leads to exhaustion, offering no benefit. Everything you create on the edge of your potential is not liminal geniality, but desperation. Regarding perfectionism, it is also rather harmful as we can redo and modify till the crack of doom and nothing will still be good enough. Artistic creativity should never be damaging and heavy. Instead, it should have us reach for the light effusing from the source of life. Try this. For at least 10 minutes a day, try omitting the first-person pronouns, I, me, mine, etc., when you have a conversation with someone. If you don't talk to anyone throughout the day, write a letter to someone omitting the exact words. This is a technique offered by writer Dorothea Brand. Limit your project. The first thing that comes to mind is a clear deadline. If there is no way to impose a temporal restriction, limit yourself on the number of words you write for a writer or journalist, or specific colors to use for a painter. Dr. Seuss used this technique while working on green eggs and ham.